Well, it's, it's just a joy being able to bring a, a different topic to, that we all think about and is so important in our lives uh, to you here today and to our, our watchers on Graceful Aging. In this segment, we're going to talk about, well, how to bring that heat and spice into your relationship, maybe tonight, maybe into your bedroom tonight. So a variety of questions. We have two wonderful guests, as you know. We've got Dr. Terry Orbuck, who's a professor of sociology from Oakland University, known as the love doctor across the country, author of numerous books, a researcher through the National Institute of Health, who studied couples over the last 28 years now and knows quite a bit about everyone's relationship. And joining her is Dr. Dennis Segru from the University of Michigan, who's a trained, certified clinical sex therapist in private practice, as well as he's been the president of the National Association of Sex Therapists and Educators. Uh, both of them bring great knowledge, and I have a lot of questions, so let's get right to these questions. So Dr. Orbuck and Dr. Segru, thanks for being with Graceful Aging again. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so stale relationships, we're going to use this half hour, and we've got lots of people wondering what they can do tonight. So how do you trigger desire in a stale relationship? Dr. Arbuck, take the first stab. Well, first, I like to suggest to couples that they begin to talk about their relationship and their sexual relationship. So begin talking about sex with your partner. It can even be the sex that's happening on the television that you're watching or that you imagined was happening on the television or that you had 30, 40 years ago. Start with a positive approach and start talking about sex. What we know is that talking about sex often is arousal producing and it can actually lead to physical intimacy and touch. But you know, our parents, even at an older age, our parents, we can hear our mother and father saying, don't use that language in this house. So doctor, do we need to start getting over and start using in this discussion that Dr. Orbach talked about, vagina and penis? Do we need to get over the hurdle and be able to incorporate those words in our conversation? Oh, absolutely. I think that one of the things that's so important for parents starting out um, is as they're raising their children, using real terms and not you know, coming up with uh, terms that the child, no one would know what they're talking about outside of the family context and so forth. Um, because what type of message are we giving our children you know, right out of the gate in terms yeah, of... But we're at the other end of the spectrum. We already made all of those mistakes and right. now here we're in this 35, 40, 45 year relationship and we've never used the words, what's our partner going to think of us? What's our mother going to think of us if we do that? Hopefully <laughs> our partner and our mother will be enlightened to say finally. Uh, <laughs> so we can start using real words, uh, adult words to describe our bodies and to kind of move beyond that to, and this is even more scandalous for many people, is to actually start talking about Here's the things that I enjoy when we're sexual together. Here's the part of your body that really excites me. When you touch me in such and such a place, um, I just want to scream. Wouldn't that be great if that was part of the nightly conversations between couples? I'm not sure which universe that's going to take place. But, uh, well, is there, is there a one time better than the other to talk in that manner? Is it... Is it after relations, before, is there a time or place that is better than another? My sense is that all of the above, but you know, it varies from couple to couple. You know, some couples um, have learned to start to talk during lovemaking. Other couples, it's total quiet. Uh, you know, I don't know if they think this is a sacred moment, so it's like being in church or synagogue and we can't talk. Uh -huh. uh, I think it's more probably childhood upbringing and, and being uptight, but certainly couples that can talk during lovemaking, uh, certainly talking about lovemaking afterwards, certainly talking about lovemaking when you're driving on a car on a cross-country trip. The point is talking. Uh, the thing that amazes us that works with couples on sexual issues is that we can find couples that have been together 30, 40 years, they have brought children in the world, they've buried parents together, they have faced 
unemployment, they have faced all types of disasters and so forth, and yet they can't talk about their sexual relationship. Uh, that's the one unspoken topic. Um, we oftentimes will suggest a whole new definition for oral sex, and oral sex is being able to talk about your sexual relationship. That can be an incredibly huh, valuable part of the relationship. Very, very interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. So you, you move beyond the Bill Clinton is word there. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yes. Uh, Dr. Orbach, you, you talked and you've written about the element of surprise. So is, is raising the topic and talking about it just out of the blue, is that one of the type of surprises that you think can generate? Think it could be, absolutely. <laughs> if you haven't done it for 30, 40, 50 years, it's going to be definitely shocking if you're sitting at the dinner table with your spouse <laughs> and you automatically say, here's what pleases me in our sexual relationship. But pass the broccoli, pa too. Pass the broccoli, right, exactly, <laughs> or what's for dessert. But I also think we have to step back. Um, for a second as well and decide that our relationship and our sexual relationship is important. You know, we're very busy in our world today. We have children and grandchildren or work and volunteering and we're trying to exercise and eat healthy and many of us don't recognize that our relationship with our partner or spouse is important and is vital to our health psychologically and physically, and part of that relationship is the sexuality that goes on in that relationship. So I think before we can even sit down and talk about it and have it happen tonight, um, we have to recognize that it's so important and that, yes, all of those other things are important in our life, but if we don't take our relationship off of that back burner, and it may be on the back burner for many of us over time because of all the things that have been happening in our life. So we have to take it off the back burner, pay attention to it, and then we can sit down and talk and say, what pleases me, and then pass the broccoli. Okay. Uh, a fantasy. Is it wrong if I'm thinking about somebody else when I'm making love to my partner? You know, it's interesting. There's, there's certainly always a lot of discussion about that. I think that most sexologists believe that fantasy is probably one of the most powerful aphrodisiacs that we have. And that making use of fantasy, um, an individual fantasy and so forth, is, is a useful way of increasing excitement, creating some novelty. Um, now with that being said, uh, what makes that kind of touchy is that if a couple engages in some, you know, very passionate lovemaking, and then afterwards kind of breathlessly holding each other, and the guy says, wow, between you and Angelina Jolie just now, <laughs> that was incredible. It'll probably be a long time before they have a repeat experience, okay? Um, so, tact, yeah. tact. So, but what we, what we do find is, and, and it's funny, different people have kind of different parameters. Uh, for some people, it's, it's okay for me to fantasize as long as it's not somebody that I know. So if it's Angelina Jolie, fine. If it's uh, Susie Smith living next door, not so fine. So, um, <laughs> but I, I think that fantasy is probably, as I said a few moments ago, probably the most powerful aphrodisiac that we know. And that we find that many couples, um, especially as the relationship kind of moves through its stages out of the initial uh, honeymoon phase and, and through the years, that fantasy can become a very valuable way of kind of keeping passion alive, but always done in a, in a respectful way towards one's partner and so forth. Is it, you know, for someone who, Dr. Orbach, someone who has been out of the intimate marketplace for some time, maybe doesn't have a lot of self-confidence, can they use fantasy in kind of learning about other people and make, in gaining more confidence? The store clerk, the, the gas station attendant, whatever. 
Absolutely. I think fantasy can be wonderful. It is imagination. It doesn't imply that you're actually going to do anything about those thoughts. And I think that's what couples really need to remember, that it doesn't mean that anyone's going to do anything with whom you're fantasizing with or imagining something with, but it's your thoughts. It's your mental processes. And the more we can use our thoughts to help our behaviors, arousal, and our bodies, the better, as long as, as was said, you know, it's used in a respectful way that we discuss it with our partner. I encourage couples to do it together, to have a discussion about fantasy. And fantasy can be with other people, it can be in other places, it can be with other behaviors. So fantasy doesn't have to only involve other people. It can involve my partner and us doing it together. And so as long as we have that communication and we talk about the parameters and the limitations, is it somebody we know or a celebrity, or is it that we are going to do it in a different spot of the house? And that can happen tonight for the audience, by the way. You know, you choose where you're going to touch or be physically intimate. Not in the bedroom, but somewhere else in the house that you've never done. There's the surprise, and there's the arousal-producing activity as well. Number step two and three of, of New Thursday. <laughs> what about initiation? You know, I, I have to wait for her to initiate, or I have to wait for him to initiate. Are there problems that couples have, and can they use the initiation of intimacy differently or better? Well, you know, it, it's interesting that the question of initiation um, is a common one that we see in sex therapy, where Probably, and the research backs up the fact that for most couples, typically the male is going to be the more frequent initiator of sexual activity. And, um, it, and it becomes you know, one of these things where uh, the guy says, you know, I'm all, if we're going to have sex, I have to initiate. So I'm not going to initiate, and we'll see just how long we go before we end up having sex. And lo and behold, six months later, he decides, bad idea. Maybe we need to try something different. Um, so one of the things that we often will try to explain to couples is that, you know, initiation or not initiating is not necessarily evidence of attraction, valuing your sexual partner, and so forth. Part of it's social scripting. Uh, part of it is, you know, basically, as males... We have a tendency to uh, be more responsive to visual cues. Women typically are more responsive to tactile cues. Now, there's exceptions to that, but that's, those are common patterns. So put, put that into tonight. Uh, for, for, a woman, for a woman to get more uh, attention from her man, what, is she, what would she need to do? And, and well, versa? obviously, if she wants more attention from her, per, you know, from her partner, uh, just based on what I just said, the visual cues would be kind of seductively undressing or whatever, if we're just talking about the visual cue okay. part. Whereas guys will, and I, I hear this constantly from men, where they'll say, you know, when my partner undresses, I just get all excited. So I thought one night, maybe that's what I need to do. So <laughs> I undress very seductively. <laughs> Didn't work. She laughed. <laughs> so... But, but she will say... Which could be good, though. <laughs> that laughter could be good. Oh, well, absolutely. It's one of those emotions to get yeah. confused with the rustle. But, you know, so basically, uh, you know, the same thing, you know, guys will say, you know, I want to make love with my partner, but she says, well, tickle my back. And it's like, I want to make love. I don't want to tickle her back. And yet, failing to realize that oftentimes it's that tactile stimulation and usually when I compare it for the guy and I'll say, you know when she does the seductive undressing and what that does to you? Yeah. Well, believe it or not, it's kind of the same pathway when you're touching and tickling her back or giving her a foot rub. That's kind of doing the same thing. It's just kind of a different universe when we're talking about men and women. Oh, I get it. So it, there is those differences between men and women. Do, do the erogenous zones change as we age? 
Not to my knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess, but you, uh, based on a study of one, no. Uh, <laughs> no, in, in all seriousness, uh, when we talk about erogenous zones, one of the interesting things is that even from person to person, there's different parts of our bodies at different times, different times of the day or from one day to the next, uh, that at one point can be very sensitive and responsive to physical stimulation, and on another day may not be the case. Um, and that's one of the things, you know, because especially a lot of times when I work with men, and uh, in the metro Detroit area, we have a higher percentage of engineers than probably any other part of the country. So I'm always seeing engineers, and part of it is because they approach Love making like their career and life in a very mechanical way. So it's like, I should be able to touch here, here, and twice here, and I should be ready to go. Bingo! And, bingo. <laughs> and maybe one out of every four times it works, and so they keep you know, that same pattern going. And yet what we find is that our bodies uh, from, from one day to the next and so forth uh, can respond differently. So. You know, women will report that breast stimulation on one particular evening can be very exciting. And on another evening, it's just downright infuriating. So what we find is that rather than getting caught up in a repetitive formula for lovemaking, it's just being open to kind of whatever happens and touching. And, gee, she's really responsive when I'm touching her here tonight. That's good. Uh, or, no, I've got to keep moving on. But, you know, realizing there are those differences. How, uh, Dr. Orbach, how do we prepare ourselves for those rejections, though? And, and, you know, how do we get over that? And how do we keep our confidence through those failed attempts? Well, there are going to be, first, a lot of failed attempts. I think that's the biggest thing we have to realize. And then the sexual arousal and desire is influenced by so many different things. When I talk to women, they talk about they can't even prioritize sexual desire. They first are thinking about, you know, the dishwasher and the laundry, and if it's, it's a younger woman with younger kids, who's going to make the lunches? And so she's putting it on a list. And so one of the things for women is that they have to have the space and time and the right situation in order to feel sexual desire. So we've got the situation, we've got our health, we've got medications. I mean, we know sleep and the number of hours you sleep every day, your medication, what you eat, what you put into your body, caffeine, alcohol, that all affects sexual desire. And so we can't take it personally when there is a failed attempt, when we say, you know, do you feel it, or should we, or should we go upstairs? And I love the language that, that couples use. Um, I always encourage couples to have fun with that. You know, find a, a, a word, even though I like that we should be using the right terms, I think it's also fun sometimes to call it something, our sexuality. What, what, terms, what terms have you heard besides <laughs> <laughs> Should we do it, or some couples will wink, or is it, you know, if they're at a party, some couples, or, or you know, with co other couples, they will say, ooh, it's a little cold in here, and that's a cue that, Mm, maybe we should go home and try. So every couple has their own wonderful language. Yeah. But it's important that if you do try to initiate, if you do try to start some physical intimacy with your partner, and it doesn't happen, or it doesn't happen as fast or as quickly or at that moment with your partner, that there are so many other reasons why you are probably not a part of it at all as the partner. And so I think that helps if you really think about that. And if you think about yourself and all the reasons why you might feel sexual desire or arousal in a given hour or second, then you can say, okay, well, my partner also has all of those same factors kind of going getting, on. Kind of getting back to your, it's not, um, it's not you, it's, it's that person experiencing exactly. that. Exactly. 
Exactly, and I think that's true in relationships in general. If your partner is upset, if your partner is in a bad mood, if your partner is frustrated, I often tell couples 90% of the time it has absolutely nothing to do with you and all to do with them. So instead of taking it personally, ask them a question about them. You sound frustrated. Is something wrong? Or uh, why was that conversation so difficult with our daughter? Or whatever. But it has to do with them, not you. Good point. So how often should people be having sex to be normal? Is there a normal amount of sex for someone 60 years of age to 70, 70 to 80, 80 to 90, six times a week, three times a week? What's going on out there? Do you want to take that? Well, I, I, you know, most couples, when I ask them how often they think they should be having it, they say 2.5 times a week. Two, the and that point five, what does that look like, right? That's the thing. Just like, you know, most couples have 2.5 children, and what does that point five of a child look like? Those are statistics, and those are based on studies with all kinds of different people at different times of their life. Um, when I asked the couples in my study, some of them said once a year, and some of them said once a month. So it varied considerably from couple to couple, year to year, and point in their relationship. Um, if I had to average them all together, the mean, but again, my couples range now from 35 to 70. It was once a month, and that's the mean, which meant some were having it less, but there were many outliers in terms of once every other month, once every year. So I think the big point for me, for couples, is there is no have to, there is no should. Um, it depends on what's going on in your life, in your in personhood, and in your relationship. Doctor, when a couple walks into your office and they say once a month, um, is, is there some you know, medical opinion like, Whoa, they're going to be in four sessions now, or yes. <laughs> or is no, no it alarms, it's okay? Or yeah, no alarms go off. Uh, one of the things that um, we find is, first of all, physically, um, the hormone that plays a very critical role for both men and women in terms of sexual desire is testosterone, and we know that testosterone, for example, in men decreases by about ten percent every decade in their life. So there's going to be a kind of a tapering off in terms of just that sheer biological <coughs> drive to want to be sexual. So one of the things that um, we, we expect to see over the lifespan is that the frequency of sex is, sex is going to decrease with each decade. What we really try to have couples do, though, is to start to expand their definition of what it means to be physically intimate. Uh, that it doesn't always have to uh, in, entail penetration. It doesn't always have to entail having an erection and so forth. That one can make beautiful love with one's partner sometimes just by touching, using what we sometimes refer to as your largest sex organ, which is the skin of your body. That's mm -hmm. how we make the connection with another person, by holding, touching, giving massage and so forth. So that... When a person comes in and they're saying, we make love once a month, uh, rather than saying, uh-oh, Will Robinson, we have a problem here, instead it's going to be more in terms of, well, tell me about the other uh, three weeks and six days. Uh, what happens during the course of that time? How much touch is there? How much time is there in terms of intimate communication? Again, we try to help couples expand their definition of what it means to make love. And um, with that being said, uh, if they come in and they say, you know, we, we talk, we do a lot of touching, and there's some genital contact at least once a month, and we feel very good about that, they should. And mm -hmm. as a therapist, I feel very good for them. I, I read uh, in preparation an interesting study on at the beginning of a relationship, the, the touching and the holding spikes beyond beyond the charts, and then it wanes as the relationship grows. And then late late in life, a, a signal of what's a good long-term relationship is the reciprocity of the touch. So I touch you, you touch me back, and it's 
do you get touched back? I thought that was interesting. Do you find that as well? Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, touch has so many important benefits, mm -hmm. not only connection to our partner, but it relieves anxiety, it relieves stress, it makes us feel better about not only ourselves psychologically, but our bodies as well. So touch has lots of really important benefits. And so we all want to be needed. All of us want to be needed. That's a biological need. And so touch is one way that we can show our partner that, that he or she is needed. The, uh, as we age, we have sometimes fewer friends, our loneliness develops. So what, what can you say for friends of older adults and, and family members? How can they encourage, say, more intimacy for them through, through touching, through... What's, what's your thought in that regard? How, I guess, let me broaden it this way. What can family and friends do to help someone as they age improve their relationship and even their sexual intimacy with the partner that they might have? That's a big question That's for big two question. minutes left in the show. I think they can model that kind of connection um, so that with their partner or their other family members, they can hug and kiss and touch. And so then giving permission to that person to do it as well. And then I think that we can also, I mean, intimacy can be a part of any kind of relationship. It doesn't have to be a romantic relationship. So if we're a family member or a friend, um, feel free and give yourself permission to touch that person, to give them a hug, to um, show them that they're needed as well. Well, with two minutes to go, our two-minute warning is up. And, and what, doctor, would you have to say for a minute to give people encouragement about there that as they age, their sexuality can improve? I think one of the most unfortunate myths that we have in our culture is that sex is for the young. Um, and it, it's, it's an incredibly unfortunate uh, myth because I think so many people buy into it. Um, I, I talk to so many folks uh, as they approach their senior years and in their senior years where they feel like I should just accept the fact that I'm no longer a kid, that all that intimacy stuff is for the kids, and I, I need to be a respectable senior. Nothing could be further from the truth. Um, I think that um, in many ways, as we get older, as we enter our senior years, um, being physically intimate with our partners, being physically comfortable with our own bodies, being able to enjoy standing under a shower and just feeling the hot water beating down our back, and to be able to feel good about what our body can produce in terms of feelings and sensations. This is so important for all of us, and to give ourselves permission to be comfortable with our, our relationships with sig significant people, spouse or, or whatever. Uh, to learn, to uh, read books, to uh, watch educational programs, and so forth, so that we don't fall into this myth that sex is only for the young. And Dr. Orbach, close us out. Mm, I think we have to have realistic expectations as well. Uh, realistic expectations that our relationships will change over time, that sometimes they won't be wonderful and sometimes they will be wonderful, that there are ebbs and flows and that's typical and normal and realistic expectations that the things that are important to us might not be important to our partner and the things that were important to us at 20 might not be important to us and our well-being and happiness and sexuality and relationships at 40, 50, 60, 70, or 80 as well. And that when we have those realistic expectations, then we're not going to be frustrated. I mean, when we have those should statements and reality doesn't match those should statements, we get frustrated and disappointed. Um, in order to stay happy, stay well, you have to have realistic expectations about those changes over time, and it's okay. Well, Art, my realistic expectation is that my time is up today for this show. <laughs> Dr. Sigru, thank you so much. Dr. Orbach, thank you so much. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you.
Their comments have been so helpful today. I hope they've helped you. Um, I hope they've helped you improve your life. Every day is important. That's what we know on Graceful Aging. We'll see you next time. Thanks for being with us. Thank you.